So hi everyone, my name is Renee. I'm calling in today from Rhode Island, although our school, Webb Institute, is in New York. Um, I'm a senior at Webb, and I'm from Rhode Island, and as I said, if you were here earlier, I will be taking a job out in California following graduation. So I'll now hand it over to Linda. She'll introduce herself, herself and start the presentation. Okay, thank you, Renee. Hi everybody, I'm Linda. I am also a senior at Webb, but I'm actually at Webb right now. Um, I'm originally from Maryland, and I will be pursuing a PhD at the University of Maryland uh, after graduation. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, Renee and I are very excited to talk about the history of our Denver campus as well today. So if I have control, oops, sorry. Okay. Some technical difficulties. Okay, great. Um, okay, so before we begin, I would like to go over a brief outline with you all. Uh, first things first, I'll start out with a brief summary of Hubert Platt and the Platt family, who are the original owners of the estate. Uh, then I'll describe the first mansion that was on the property, the country house, and then I will discuss the architecture and landscape architecture of the second mansion, the Braze, that we know today. I will then hand it off to Renee and she will explain the property's transition to becoming the Webb Institute campus and describe the other buildings on the property. And at the end, we will have some time for questions. Okay, so Charles Pratt was the patriarch of the Pratt family. He made the Pratt family fortune with Asheville Oil Works and Standard Oil in 1884. He was a philanthropist and established the Platt Institute in 1887. And he was also a family man. And as wedding presents for each one of his sons, he funded mansions to be built on the family property, DeSource Park, uh, which was a significant chunk of what is Glen Cove today. Uh, DeSource Park had stables, a garage, dairy facilities, and a beach that all of the brothers shared. Herbert Pratt is the brother we are interested in today. He was the sixth and youngest son of Charles, and he commissioned and lived in the Braves. He graduated from Amherst College in 1895, married his wife Florence a couple years later, and shortly thereafter commissioned the first house on the estate. He was also successful in his own right and became president of Standard Oil in 1923. Is there a Zoom error? I think there might Okay, be. we're good. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Um, but before we jump into the architecture of the houses, I would like to briefly go over the architects, James Bright and Henry Bacon. Uh, Bright and Bacon met when they were both working for McKim, Mead, and White in Manhattan. In 1897, they split off from that company and made their own architectural firm, aptly named Bright and Bacon Architects. Uh, Bright was a lesser known architect from North Carolina, and Bacon was actually a very popular architect at the time. He was a celebrated late Greek revival and Beaux Arts architect and was very accomplished. Uh, he designed the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., and the Union Square Savings Bank in Manhattan. Okay, so Bright and Bacon were commissioned by Herbert Pratt to design the first house on the property, which we call the Country House. Uh, completed in 1902, it looks very different from the Braves we know today. Uh, it was made of wood and was in the Georgian Revival style. Here we can see some of Bacon's influence on the southern facade, the picture on the left, we have a pedimented ionic portico, and on the right, the northern facade facing the water, we have a very large balustrated porch. Um, additionally, the house's gabled roof is also in the Georgian Revival style. The house was also similarly laid out to the current race today. It had a main section and two wings. The main section had an entrance hall and a living room and dining room for the family. The west wing had a billiards room and den, and then the east wing had the kitchen and the servants hall. Here on the left, we see the entrance hall of the country house, and on the right is the dining room. Uh, we can see that the interiors of the house were also completed in the Georgian Revival style. 
So a few years pass and Herbert's wife, Florence, goes on vacation to England and she comes back to New York and she tells Herbert, I don't like my house anymore, I want this house. And Herbert was like, okay, happy wife, happy life. And he calls up Bright and he tells him that he needs a new house. So they tear down the country house to build a new one. So this is the Grams Hill house. It is in Northern Hampshire, England, completed in 1605 with alterations made in 1612. And it's in the Jacobian style. The Jacobian style named after King James I is a 17th century English Renaissance style. Bright had actually already done some work with the new Jacobian style in the United States. Uh, here are some of his works before he worked on the second grave. Uh, the upper left is the Scranton Memorial Library that he completed in 1898. The lower left is Darlington, which was the country estate of George Crocker, who was the son of an oil magnate. Uh, that was completed in 1904. And on the right is uh, an 1899 townhouse that was in Manhattan. Unfortunately, that one was torn down, but the left two are still standing if you want to go. So Bright then designed the Braze. Unlike the first house, this one was made primarily of limestone and brick and was completed in the Neo-Jacobian style. Um, examples of the Jacobian influence uh, proliferate the exterior of the structure. Um, for example, the limestone coining on the building's corners, the lintels and mullions on the windows, the style of the chimney tops, their elongated, spiked, and grouped in the Jacobian style. Um, the baluster with parapets on the roof line, uh, the string courses marking the floor lines and the elevations are all in the Jacobian style. Uh, the H style layout is also Jacobian. Um, however, Bright did throw in a curveball and we can see in the arcades and in the entrances that he did add some classical detailing to the house. The interior of the house was decorated primarily with Tudor style ornamentation. Uh, we can see this in the leaded casement windows and the elaborate and dark wood wainscot paneling throughout the house. Uh, Bright also used quite a bit of Flemish Renaissance style ornamentation uh, that can be seen in the strap work pattern of the balustrade parapets, as well as the prevalent ornamental ceiling plaster work. So the one exception to these motifs was the drawing room, which we now call the reception room. Uh, the photo on the left is the reception room today, and the photo on the right was the drawing room in 1912. The original drawing room was completed in the Georgian style. However, when Webb bought the property in the 40s, the room had deteriorated so badly that they had to completely refinish the room, uh, which is why it looks so different today. One interesting part of the house that I would like to mention is the Rother West room, which is where we have our reading room today. Uh, the Rother West room was actually 300 years older than the rest of the house. It was completed in 1611 as a part of the Rother West estate in Hertfordshire, England for the Bodenham family. In 1912, the last Bodenham died and the estate was dismantled and auctioned off. And Herbert bought this room and told Bright, I want to put this in my house, can you make it happen? And Bright was like, yeah, sure, no problem. So the Rother West room became the Pratt living room. And the room was very beautiful. It had walnut paneling and a very intricately carved oak mantelpiece with the Bonin family coat of arms. However, in 1944, Herbert bequeathed this room to his alma mater Amherst. So that's where the room is today. Uh, it's in the main art museum, so you can go visit it in person if you'd like. And so the reading room we have here today is actually just a replica. So on to the landscaping. The Pratt's had three main landscape architects, James Greenleaf, Ellen Shipman, and Isabella Bowen. Uh, Greenleaf was a very accomplished landscape architect. Uh, originally from upstate New York, he earned a civil engineering degree from Columbia and was actually the landscape architect for the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., the one that Bacon designed. Um, so for the Braves, he designed the three main terraces, stepping down for the water, um, two long open garden pergolas, one extending from the western loggia to the tea room, and the other extending from the eastern loggia to a children's playroom. Um, he designed a formal rose garden on the western facade of the house uh, and a formal water garden on the 
second year. Okay. There you go. Um, Shipman was a gifted horticulturist and was an enthusiast of the Cornish style, which is known for its uh, geometric patterns and colonial planting. Um, she worked jointly with Greenleaf to design the other landscaping on the property. Um, and then finally, Bowen was from Cincinnati, Ohio, and was educated at the Lowbrook School for Landscape Architecture, which was one of the most respected landscape architecture schools for women at the time. She was hired after Greenleaf and Shipman and designed an iris garden for the Platt family in the 1930s. So I included a lot of pictures of the gardens circa 1912, so you can get a feel for how the campus looked while the Pratts lived there. And we can see here the three terraces going down to the water, and the second terrace still has the water garden. Uh, here we can see a photo taken during landscape construction. Um, so on the left, we have a team of horses pulling a tree, which I thought was very interesting. And then the photo on the right is just looking at the, the Western Moja. Um, this is the formal water, water garden on the second terrace. And in the water garden, we can see Shipman's influence in the geometric shapes of the reflecting pools. Uh, Greenleaf and Shipman also included some sculptures in the garden, like the statue of Hercules that we can see on the left. And Hercules is actually still on campus. He has since been moved to the Peggy Michelle Memorial Garden on the uppermost terrace. Uh, here on the left, we can see one of the pergolas connecting the main building to the tea room, which has since been repurposed as a conference room. And on the right is a photo of the rose garden on the western facade of the house. This is the iris garden designed by Isabella Bowen. Um, unfortunately, it's no longer a part of the campus, but the colors would have been limited to blue, purple, and mauve. And with that, I will hand it off to Renee. Okay, can everybody hear me? Let's just confirm that. Perfect. Make sure I have control of my slides here. Okay, so thanks, Linda. Now that you all have a sense of the aura of the main building and surrounding grounds, I'd like to tell you about how it ended up transitioning from that 1920s summer home into a college. So here you can see a bird's eye view of the Webb Institute campus and circled here is the braze that she told you about. Before I begin to go into detail about Webb, I should introduce you to our founder, William Webb. In 1831, at the age of just 15, he declared his intention to become an apprentice to his father, a successful shipbuilder in New York, so he himself could learn the art of shipbuilding. Eight years later, his father died, and William Webb took over the family's New York City shipyard at the age of 23. A master at his craft, Webb quickly became a millionaire shipbuilder and designer. In his career, he designed and built 135 cutting edge vessels and became internationally known in the maritime industry for his work. At the time, ship design had been considered an art form, but Mr. Webb recognized that the ship designers of the future would have to be engineers, skilled in structural systems and mechanical engineering and other scientific and mathematical disciplines. It was that realization which led Webb in 1889 to found a naval design school and home for retired shipbuilders on 13 acres in the Bronx. Here you can see that beautiful facility. In the 10 years he was able to be involved with the institution's operations before he died, Webb instilled great educational goals to educate students to be professional ship design experts. To his academy and home for shipbuilders, he left an endowment intended to be sufficient to allow the institution to be self-supporting in perpetuity. It thrived for more than 50 years at this location. When the Herbert Lee Pratt Estate went up for sale in 1945, selling the original Webb's Academy and Home for Shipbuilders in the Bronx in favor of moving to the larger 16-acre Glen Cove Estate simply made sense. The new area offered space to grow, unlike in the Bronx, and there was easy and immediate access to the waterfront. The Bronx property sold for $1.1 million to a realtor who planned to construct a large apartment complex on the land. Webb bought the Pratt estate for only 110,000 from Pratt's five surviving children who had joint owned the estate after his death in early 1945. 
the profit of nearly $1 million could be used to convert the estate to better suit the needs of the school. I'd call that a pretty good deal. So the conversion of the Braves into Stevenson Taylor Hall, named after the first president who took over after Webb's death, began shortly after the property was acquired in late 1945. Here you can see students on the grounds in the 1950s. And you should notice that all the students are men. Uh, women were not allowed at Webb until the late 1970s. So since its conversion, Stevenson Taylor Hall has served as the primary dorm for about 80 of the students who attend Webb Institute for college. And so you have a better idea, Webb is a small four-year college that specializes solely in naval architecture and marine engineering, which is what I like to say a mouthful for ship design and operation. A maximum of 28 students called Webbies are admitted each year. Webb is unique in that all roughly 100 students live on campus and study that same major. It is the only college in the United States to specialize solely in naval architecture and marine engineering and the only one to offer full tuition scholarships to all who attend. The Institute stresses both academic excellence and moral earnestness, requiring students to adhere to a rigid honor code and encouraging them to be hardworking, collaborative, and self-governing. Now I'd like to take you inside to see where this magical education happens. The front door opens into this impressive two-story tall main hallway that extends nearly the entire width of the building, which is about 125 feet. The original set of grand matching staircase, um, staircases marks the end of the long hall, whose walls are decorated with a collection of large wooden ship models once housed in the Bronx facility. The ceiling throughout the main hall is the original ornamented plaster that was seen by the Prats that Linda spoke about. The Western Wing houses a mailroom and elegant offices for our president and his assistant. What is now the president's office was once Mr. Pratt's study. And the Eastern Wing currently houses the faculty dining room and it was originally the Pratt's breakfast room. At the Eastern end of the main hall is the student dining room, essentially unchanged from the braise except for the furniture. The kitchen is in the basement in the same spot it was when the Pratt's lived there and the same combination prep table and pot rack that you can see here. Um, we're in front of the stove when the Pratts lived there and are still in use today. So when Webb relocated to the Glen Cove campus in the 1940s, they inherited additional buildings already on the property when the Pratts lived there. I've listed the current names of these buildings here and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about each one. So together, let's go on a tour. First, we will take a walk to the metal shop, which is this building at the edge of campus here. It was originally Herbert Lee Pratt's garage. It was made into a machine shop for pedantic and recreational use by web students and faculty. It contains all the necessary equipment for welding and machining metal, which are vital processes in shipbuilding. The garage was built in 1913 and is two stories tall with car sized entrances on both levels. It originally contained a turntable on the first floor, uh, which is cool because Mr. Pratt's cars would be driven in and turned and parked into their uh, normal parking space. A chauffeur's apartment was also included on the second floor. That apartment has since been refurbished, uh, but it still is used to house a member of staff um, on campus for student services and emergencies. The building is characterized by a large amount of Italian white marble trim on its exterior. James Bright, the architect Linda told you about, designed this building too. The engineer in me must tell you about its roof, uh, and I have to apologize because I don't have a picture of it, but the roof is a self-supporting Gauss Divino vault, uh, which is created using uh, interlocking tiles and layers of mortar. The Gauss Divino vaults can be found uh, in some of New York City's uh, famous landmarks, including the Ellis Island Registry Room, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, parts of Grand Central Terminal and the South Arcade of the Manhattan Municipal Building. So this here is the Ellis Island Reg Registry Room to get an idea of the roof. Next stop on our tour is the White House. This building was originally part of the Pratt's first summer home that Linda talked about. When the Pratt's decided to have their original summer residence torn down and rebuilt into what is now Stevenson Taylor Hall, the West Wing was moved to its current location at the edge of the property. For Webb, the house has had many purposes. It served as the president's residence, the location of the research department, 
senior overflow housing, um, faculty and staff housing, and even as the residence and offices of a dentist who once leased the building. When the Prats were still on the property, it contained a billiards room and a den. The woodshop and plant superintendent's house um, are the next stops on our tour, and they're located in this area. Here you can see the house, but the woodshop is hidden below the trees. An old carriage garage, originally left on the property, was modified in 1951 for use as a woodshop. It provides ample working space for freshmen who in their first month at Webb build wooden boats and teams to race across Long Island Sound. Just north of the woodshop is a house for the head of maintenance. The house was created on footings of a greenhouse that once served the Prada State. It is big enough to house the plant superintendent and his family. Here are some photos of the woodshop today. You can see the barn door entrance here. And in these photos, you also get a glimpse of the machine shop I spoke about and the plant superintendent's house. Over time, since Webb acquired the Glen Cove campus, the Institute has expanded and built structures to better accommodate the needs of their enrolled students. Those buildings include Motley Hall, the gym, the Robinson Model Basin, the library, and the auditorium. It is important to note that these additions have maintained the country life and luxurious feel of that fabled gold coast of Long Island where all these uh, rich businessmen lived. So Motley Hall was the first building constructed on campus here. It was built as an employee dorm because at the time it was difficult to get to Long Island with um, la a lack of public transportation. The gym was constructed shortly after along with the model basin across the way. For a school which trains naval architects and marine engineers, this lab facility is very important. The first wave maker was added to the tank inside um, in 1963, which allowed for more complex testing. Finally, the library and auditorium were made in 1971 and were built to connect to the main building. Now some additional buildings I'll tell you more about in the following slides include the graduate school, the Haberly Laboratory, the President's House, and the Yacht Club. First, we'll see the Graduate School, which is located here. When it was added in 1950, it served as a graduate school where students could continue studies at Webb for one additional year to earn a master's degree. The program was discontinued shortly after it started, however. The program has, I mean, some, sorry, the building has since had several uses including um, offices for faculty and for the development department. An advanced learning center was added in 2010. In 1956, the Haverly Laboratory was added to improve the academic facilities at Webb. The lab facility is broken up into sections specializing in various disciplines related to naval architecture and marine engineering. A garage built next to the Haverly Laboratory has two bays, which interested students use to service their own cars, motorcycles, and trucks. The president's house was the first building which was not built in the style of the others on campus. And you can see that in this photo here. It's a ranch style house designed and built by Michael Pescucci of Glen Cove. The building has housed six presidents of Webb and it was built in 1968. So the final stop on our tour will be the Yacht Club. For a school <laughs> with a bunch of students who study boats, the Yacht Club is an important part of campus. In 1946, even before the Webbies came to Glen Cove from the Bronx, they had a Yacht Club organized with an elected Commodore and all. The students were so excited to get waterfront access and be able to have boats on campus. Today, with a variety of watercraft stocked in the boathouse by the beach, Web students can often be found on the waterfront after classes and on weekends in fair weather when they're still on campus. So that concludes our tour. And I just wanted to add that through this project that I did over a year ago now to learn all these little details I shared with you today, I gained a whole new appreciation for studying on this campus that has so much history to be treasured. I'm very happy that Linda and I had the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about it um, and we hope one day you could visit for a real tour when it's safe to do so.